chapter 8, we are making our way through some of the miracles of Christ here on uh, Wednesday night Bible study, and some things that we can learn, some things we can learn from those miracles. Luke chapter 8 and verse, excuse me, verse 26 is where I'll begin reading. It says here, And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode any, neither abode in any house. But in the tombs, and I'm going to just stop here for a second and make a comment. Something you often see uh, when it comes to devils and demon possession and other things like that uh, in the scriptures is you see a lot of similarities. You'll see things associated with nakedness. Uh, that is part of that. That's influence from devils. You see also uh, people who uh, are overemphasizing death. Uh, that's why they were in the tombs, uh, things like that. That's stuff the devil loves to do is get us to emphasize those type of things. Uh, but it goes on here, it says in verse 28, When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oft times it had caught him. And he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and were choked. When they that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also which saw it told them by what means he that was possessed of the devils was healed. Then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear, and he went up into the ship and returned back again. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thine own house, and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. I've simply been titled this message from possessed to blessed. And uh, God is the one who can make a drastic difference in someone's life. Sometimes we, we come across people that we think is a hard case. Like, man, I just don't know if they would ever get saved. And we come across people like that from time to time. But nothing is impossible with God. And we see that example, that situation right here with this particular individual. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. And we'll ask his blessing on this message. Father, we come to you and we thank you that, Lord, you do all things well. And, Lord, so oftentimes in our lives, we don't always understand uh, how you're working and what you're doing to work in our lives. But we're thankful that you're patient with us. We're thankful, Lord, that you uh, are just a great, great Heavenly Father. You love us. You care for us. You're very tender towards us. But, Lord, you are also firm when, when we need a firm hand. Father, I pray if there be any in our service that's not sure if heaven is their home, that, Lord, they will get us settled here tonight. Lord, I pray also for those of us who are believers. I pray that, Lord, we might learn what we can learn from this particular miracle, and then, Lord, we can use it in our lives from here on out. And, Father, we just want you to be honored. We want you to be glorified and magnified in our lives. We pray these things and ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there is obviously no such thing as an impossible case with God. I'd like you to see in verse 35, it says here, it says, Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, 
sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Well, who was sitting at the feet of Jesus? Was it the maniac? Or was it the man who had been the maniac? Well, obviously it was the one who had been the maniac. It, this guy now was completely changed, and notice where he was. He was sitting at the feet of Jesus. We find this same miracle. He, he was a changed man, but we find this same miracle. We're going to look at these two parallel passages, and this is all I'm going to have to turn to here tonight. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 8. Because we get a little bit bigger picture of what's going on here in the story. From Luke chapter 8, we only see the emphasis on one individual that was possessed with devils. But from Matthew chapter 8, we find that there were actually two possessed with devils. And we don't see that, and there's, I think, a reason for that, uh, that we don't see that in the other gospel accounts. But Matthew chapter 8 and verse 28 it says, and when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, and that's the same area, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Something else that we see here with demon possession is they are exceeding fierce. They basically do not respect life. They do not respect uh, the, the Bible talks about uh, violence, and God says that his, uh, he abhors the soul that loves violence. We ought not love violence, and all of that is associated with devils. Verse 30 goes on and says, And there was a good way off from them and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou castest out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled and went their ways into the city and told everything and what was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, and I always thought this was amazing, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. This is just like Israel wanted to go back into Egypt. God led them with a mighty hand. They whined and complained and said, oh, you know, we're under hard bondage. You know, God delivers, God delivers. And God came to deliver them and led them into the wilderness because he wanted to prove them and wanted to go through a lot of things. And then when they went through the test, they started whining and complaining and said, we just want to go back to Egypt. Oh, it's so much better to be in Egypt. And so oftentimes we're like that if we're not careful. But these people, we find themselves here, or they find themselves in a similar situation. They see this great miracle. They didn't witness it, but they came out and saw the swine that they were destroyed, probably floating now in the water. And uh, all of this happened, and they besought Jesus that he would depart out of the coast. One other place, I want you to turn, turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, as we see the other account. And we call Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those three Gospels together are known as the Synoptic Gospels. Most of the stories, uh, the parables, the teachings, the miracles, they have a lot of similarities in common. John's a little bit different, uh, but that we call both those, all three of those Gospels the Synoptic Gospels. Mark chapter 5 verse 1 says this, Get back there. It says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs. Now notice what else here we see. This is not the message, but notice what else goes along with devils. We see crying and cutting himself with stones. Uh, often that's a big thing that's been around now for several years is people cutting themselves. Self-mutilation is what they've done. They're almost addicted to pain. That is associated with demons. That doesn't mean the person's demon-possessed. It just means they are under demonic influence for sure. It goes on here, verse 6, But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice and said, 
What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God Most High? I'm sorry, Son of the Most High God. I endure thee by God, that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there, and obviously they felt at ease at that country. Um, it says here in verse 11, Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They, they were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart, to depart out of their coast. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed, and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. And there's a lot of things we're going to look at here, and this is why I wanted to read all three of these accounts together, because there's a lot of stuff. Uh, there's actually just three quick points, but there's a lot of things in those points I'm just going to point out to you here. The, in verse 20, we see that this individual uh, who had the legion of demons in himself, he wanted to be with Jesus. He just wanted to spend time with Jesus. And oftentimes when we get saved, that's what we want because Jesus is our ark of safety. He is our safe haven. He is our comfort. He is our friend. He is our shepherd. He's our guide. He's our protector. He's all of these wonderful things for us. And sometimes that's where we want to stay, but that's not God's will. God's will is for us to go out into the highways and hedges and compel others to come in. He wants us to be a witness. And if you notice in these three accounts, this man was sent to one primary group, and that was his family. His family was top importance. Now, he went to his family, but we see in the gospel account according to Mark, we see also that he went into the Decapolis. Now, the Decapolis is, uh, a, it actually means ten Cities. This guy was so excited he couldn't just hold his containment to his family. He was so excited with what happened. He went to ten cities and published this thing, everything that Jesus had done. I believe this is probably the start of a great revival because many individuals around that region would have heard of this particular individual, would have heard of him and heard about his problem living in the tombs and cutting himself. Besides that, he would have still had the scars on his body where he had often cut himself. Those things would still be there. So in this message, I want you to see, I'm going to be back in Luke, and I'm going to just kind of refer to the other two accounts briefly. I just want you to see three things here very quickly. Number one, the condition of the men. The condition of the men. The man to whom the Lord calls our attention to was in a horrible situation. But at the end of the story... We see the people who was in the people who were in the worst condition was not the man with the legion of devils. It was the individuals who lived in the region. You see, the man who had the legions of devils, he was healed, he was changed. He wanted to sit at the feet of Jesus. But the ones with the bigger problem were the ones who were just afraid. They didn't know and understand what was going on, and they besought Jesus that he would depart from them. We see a lot of that today. People are afraid of the truth. People are afraid of what the light is going to do because of what it uh, sheds. Sometimes people don't get saved because they're afraid they're going to have to completely change their life. And, and it's not that we have to worry about changing our life. We just come to Jesus as we are and he'll do the changing in our life. But so oftentimes fear keeps people from doing the things that they, they ought to do. These tomb dwellers... Uh, the question was asked by another preacher one time, said, were these tomb dwellers any worse than the men who drove Jesus out of their coast? I don't think they were. And you know, there's only one devil, and the devil is not almighty. 
The devil is not all-knowing. He's not all-powerful. He's not uh, omniscient like God is. He doesn't know all these things. The devil can only be at one place at one time. He's not omnipresent. The devil is a finite creature. He's a created being. He is an angel, but he is a powerful angel. He's way more powerful than we are, but he is nothing compared to God. And when we think about the word devils, we see the word devils throughout these three accounts. And this is the same as demons. These are beings who have, uh, these were basically the fallen angels. This was not all of the fallen angels, but this was part of the fallen angels. Now, anytime we start thinking about the devil and his demons and when the devil's attacking us and all these things, and the attacks can be very real. But we have to remember, only one third of the angels fell. Two thirds of the angels are, the Bible calls them, ministering spirits. They're there to help us. They're there to carry our prayers back and forth to God. They're there to lift us up in difficult times. They're there, they serve a lot of purposes. Two thirds of them are on our side. Only one third are against us. So the next time we start giving the devil a little too much credit, we need to realize God has also, and, and of course the Bible does teach a little bit of a concept of uh, what we've come to call guardian angels. You know, they are watching over us. They do different things like that. And I've always teased uh, Becky that uh, she has these guardian angels. And I was like, man, when you get to heaven, your guardian angels are going to be like, oh, man, I didn't think she's ever going to make it. It's like, man, what do we have to do to get her here? Because she has had so many things that has happened in her life. That, I tell you what, these angels just watched over her, have protected her. Uh, I think I told you the story maybe one time. Uh, we were down in Tennessee, and she had all the kids with her. had five of them, and they're all little. And uh, Elizabeth, trying to be the little helper she was, I think she's probably nine, ten years old. And uh, she actually closed the door, and Becky's purse was still in the van. The windows were rolled up. It was all, all the doors were locked, and Abigail's still in the car seat. And, of course, down in Tennessee, it's hot. So, you know, she's like, oh, yeah, what happened? And just as soon as she started to panic, here comes a guy around. Has one of those Jimmy things. I don't know what you call them. But uh, he's like, you got a problem, man? You locked out your car. Whip that thing out, put it in there. And just in a matter of seconds, that door was open. And she's just like, are you an angel? <laughs> he probably was. I'm going to tell you, he probably was. Because I know many stories that she's had. And he's like, well, I've been called a lot of things, but I've never been called an angel. So, But uh, I always thought that story was kind of humorous. But, you know, we do have things like that. These angels are ministering spirits protecting us. But we need to realize only one-third of the angels fell. So don't give them too much credit. Uh, now, if you're a Christian, something that, and I don't have time to get into all this, this part of the message because this really isn't it. But uh, if you're a Christian, you don't have to worry about being possessed by a demon. Now why is that? The Holy Spirit. When you got saved, the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God came and He now lives in you. And this is where our salvation is different than the Old Testament saint salvation. They got saved by faith just like you and I. But the difference with their salvation is the Holy Spirit's ministry in their life. In our life, the Holy Spirit now comes and dwells us. That's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we have the Holy Spirit from that point onward. The Holy Spirit would come upon them in the Old Testament and then depart. Come upon them and then depart. Now, the only one that we may think of that maybe that didn't happen to is maybe David. Uh, but it, it, was, it could have happened to anyone in the Old Testament. Because the, the one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit was not to indwell believers until Christ came and then the Holy Spirit was the spirit of promise, and he was sent to comfort us. He was sent to be our guide, uh, all of these things that he was going to do for us, and he does do for us. So we don't have to worry about demonic possession because the Holy Spirit is not going to live inside of us and also allow resident of a demon to come in. But let me say this also when it comes to demons. And there's, there's some pastors who disagree with this. I've heard pastors say, oh, well, this stuff like this that we just read about here in the Bible, that only happened in Jesus' day. We don't see stuff like that today. I don't know where you've been, but you didn't live in the same neighborhood I lived in. You didn't live in the same homes I lived in. There are demons very active today. Matter of fact, they are getting 
more active today than what they have been in the past. And I think the only difference is we are so spiritually blinded today by so many things, we don't even recognize demon possession anymore. Back then, they recognized it in a hurry. There were some things that stood out to them. Today, we everybody seems to be cutting themselves. Everybody seems to be dealing with nakedness and all this other stuff. It's everywhere. We don't even know how to recognize influence of demons in our lives because it's so common. But what I do want to say is this when it comes to demons. A Christian cannot be possessed by a demon, but they can be controlled. How do we know that? Because Romans chapter 6, verse I think it's verse 16, tells us, To whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey. Now you can choose to serve self. You can choose to serve the devil. You can choose to serve these demonic influences and be deceived by them. Or you can choose to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have the choice. We're going to serve somebody. The question is who? That's it. We ought to serve God or we're going to serve either ourselves or these demonic influences that come into our life. And again, they're very, very deceptive. You know, if I was to ask you what the devil looked like, what would you say? Okay, so okay, we don't know. We do know a little bit about what he looks like. But what does the world think he looks like? Okay, he's got a pitchfork, he's got a tail, it's got a little you know, prong thing on his tail. And uh, anything else come to mind? Horns, red suit, you know, or whatever he's got. The Bible says be fair to look upon. Yeah, matter of fact, the Bible teaches. He's a beautiful creature. The Bible doesn't describe anything like that, but you think the devil wants you to think of him in a red suit, pitchfork, and, you know, with horns and all that? The devil loves that. He loves to be mischaracterized because the Bible says he can appear as an angel of light. He loves for us to mischaracterize him. He loves to look so bad and wicked. And then what happens is he comes in and he appears to be very harmless. And that's how he sneaks in. We have to be very careful. We have to be wise as servants and harmless as doves. But a Christian cannot be possessed by a demon. But we can be controlled because we have allowed ourselves to be controlled. The influences that we allow in our life. The devil loves to, and I don't know why I'm getting off on all this because this is not at all the message. But the devil loves to use music. Music is such a powerful tool. The devil loves to use music. Matter of fact, many people think, uh, many Bible scholars have thought that was his number one ministry. That his number one ministry was music in heaven. Now, do you think he's going to use music? You betcha. I've heard so many ignorant Christians, and I'm saying they're ignorant Christians, because ignorance can be fixed. But they are ignorant Christians. They say, all music can't be good or bad. It's all moral. In other words, it has no moral value. No. A note on the piano, if I was to have Miss Lark over there and play a note on the piano, boom, that has no moral value. But the moment I start putting notes together, there's now a message. How do we know that? Because I could do something like this. What are you thinking of? Amazing Grace. Why? Because there's a message. Did I say anything? Nope. Just hum some notes. It now has a message when you start putting these things together. You want to find out if uh, the devil can use music? You can put a little two-year-old or three-year-old in the back seat of a car. And, of course, now you've got to have them buckled in a car seat. On. But it used to be we loved to play in the back seat of the car. We'd always get up on our knees and can't hold, you know, didn't have any hands. And we would try to see who could go around the turns because my dad loved to drive real crazy. We'd like to see who could go around the turns without falling over. And we had a blast in the back. So you can't have fun anymore in a car. Uh, you just you got to sit there and just do nothing. But, you know, you want to see, what I started to say, though, is you want to see if music affects kids. Put a two- or three-year-old back there that's just now learning to stand up and put on some type of you know, heavy metal. See what the response is. They probably don't even know the song, but I guarantee you you're going to start seeing all kinds of craziness come out of it. You put on something like Mozart or Beethoven, Baby Einstein, see what they do. 
I guarantee you the reaction is not going to be the same. You know why? Because music affects us. The devil loves to use music. The devil loves to use the internet. He loves to use TV. He loves to use radio. He loves to use any avenue he can to try to influence in a negative way. We have to be aware of this. Now, God can use these same avenues. That doesn't mean we just do away with all music or we do away with all TV or we do with it. God can use these same avenues for the glory of God. But we need to be aware the devil is the prince of the power of the air. He knows how to use this stuff, so be very careful. Um, let's see here. I'll get back on my message here. Uh, the condition of these men. Now, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and 12 tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What that is telling us is there are levels of authority when it comes to the spirit world. Uh, now, we don't see what these levels of authority are, but there's probably uh, a demon over top of, or in charge of Kashmir, or a demon over top of, and probably one over Monroe County, and one over Peterson. I mean, we don't know how many angels there are, but again, only one-third of them fell. Two-thirds are on our side. But they do have levels of authority. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that's of course the Holy Spirit, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, now listen to this, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's talking about Christians. Christians are going to do this. It doesn't mean you're getting possessed. You're just giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We're, we're yielding ourselves to the wrong thing. That's going to happen in the last days. We see it all around us. We know also the Bible teaches that in the last days there's going to be an increase in demonic activity. Do you think we see that anywhere in our society? Don't have to look very far anymore. It's there. The devil, obviously, as we mentioned, he can appear as an angel of light. He's not, you know, doesn't have a pitchfork and a red suit. That's the way the world wants to portray. That's the way the devil wants to be portrayed as. But he wants to come off very harmless because that's the quickest way he can get into our lives. Now, we can be controlled by the things that we allow in our life. So when we see here about the change of these men, there were two individuals that were both demon-possessed. We don't know that the other one had a, had a legion of demons. A legion of demons uh, would be about three to 6,000 demons. Some people said 2,000. It doesn't matter. That's a lot of demons. But we do know this. There were 2,000 pigs, 2,000 swine. Each one of them had to have at least one demon. So there had to be a minimum of 2,000. That's a lot of demons in one individual. This guy must have been in a miserable state. But the good news is Christ saved him. Christ rescued him. We don't know how many demons this other individual had. We know there were two possessed with devils. The one had a legion. The other we don't know much about because he's only mentioned in the one account. Now my question is, where was he? The Bible doesn't say anything about him sitting at the feet of Jesus. The Bible does say that the demons were cast out of him. This is a, kind of reminds me and is a picture to me of what happens sometimes to, to Christians who get saved and maybe for a little while you know, they're faithful to God, they serve God, but somewhere along the path they just kind of fizzle out. They're no longer thankful. They're not sitting at the feet of Jesus anymore. They, they forget what they have been saved from. Well, it was fresh in this man's mind, and he wanted to let everybody know about it. And that's exactly what he did, and God used him in a great way. So this brings us here to the change in the men. We know Jesus is recognized by the demons as being God in human flesh. That's why he's called the Son of God. That means that was his title. He was recognized as being God in human flesh. Mary Magdalene was another individual Jesus had cast some demons out of. She had seven devils cast out of her. And these demons knew that hell was a real place. That's why they said, torment us not before the time. They knew hell was a real place. They knew it's a place of torment. They didn't have to be convinced. But today we have people who uh, have to be convinced that hell is a real place. Matthew 25, 41, uh, the Bible tells us, as a matter of fact, Jesus tells us there that hell was not created for mankind. The next time you're trying to witness to somebody and they talk about hell, it's like, well, you know, why does God want to send anybody to hell anyway? 
He doesn't. The Bible says what? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Matter of fact, in another place it says, who will have all men to be saved? Speaking of God, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth? But in Matthew 25, 41, it says very specifically that hell was created for whom? The devil and his angels. But when mankind sinned, that's why that one verse seems to tell us that the fall of the angels took place somewhere before maybe day six of creation or maybe uh, even before mankind fell. We don't know exactly when man fell after his creation there in the garden. But the fall of the angels had to occur before that. That's why Satan came and tempted Eve. And then hell was created for them because of what had taken place. But was not created for mankind. But as soon as man sinned, now God had to send mankind there. But God provided a way for man not to have to go. I'm thankful for that. I hope you are as well. Amen. Revelation 20 verse 10 teaches us also that there is no escape from hell. Some, some religions teach that uh, there's a purgatory. There's kind of like a halfway house. Or uh, you can pray or get baptized for the dead. And they go to this holy place. And if you get baptized for them... Because they were just a horrible person in their life. You can get baptized with them and then they can go to that. No, no, no. That is nowhere in the Bible. This is a real place. It is a permanent resident. Once you take your last breath in this life, that's it. You are either going to one of two places. You're going to heaven because you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Or you're going to hell because you rejected the Son of Jesus Christ. And you're going to be in those two places for all eternity. Now, some people say, well, you might you go to heaven, but I thought we were coming back to this earth to rule and reign with Christ. We're always with Jesus. Where he is, that's where we're going to be. And he's going to destroy this earth one day, and he's going to create a new heaven, a new earth, and, and that's a message for another time as well. But before this event, Jesus had calmed the sea, and now he calmed the turmoil that was going on in this man's life. What we need in our life is we need to have what this one individual had. We need to have evidence that there's been a change. That's what the Bible teaches throughout. This is why we need to grow as a Christian. There ought to be evidence in our life there's been a change made. Now, when little kids get saved, and we have several in the church that get saved, and uh, even when our kids were little, and uh, they say, you know, I've gotten saved, we're all in. They want to get baptized. What do we look for? We look for a change. We're looking for attitude change. We're looking for a change. Are they uh, more obedient now? Are they obeying quicker? I mean, they're still going to sin. They're still going to do things wrong because the flesh never got saved. But there should be a change that is noticeable. There should be a change in you and I that's noticeable to others. It shouldn't be noticeable to us, but it should be noticeable to others as well. Just like this man. And the last thing I want you to see here, we saw the condition of these men, the change in these men, but... Notice the commission that was given to this one man. It always makes me think where the other one was, but he wasn't there. But this one man, he didn't stop and say, and sometimes we do this too. And I mean, just being honest with ourselves, sometimes we like, well, what are they going to do? Sometimes we feel like we're doing everything. This happens at home sometimes. Sometimes the wife feels like, you know, she's washing the dishes, she's doing laundry, she's doing all. Well, what's what's he going to do? Well, why don't you follow him around all day and see? And if he's not laying on the couch all day, he's probably busy. <laughs> probably busy providing an income. Sometimes the guy, he's out working for an income, and you know, the wife's staying at home with the kids and thinks, well, all she's doing is staying at home. What's she got to do? Why don't you follow her around a little bit and try it out? I guarantee you, you'll probably work harder than you ever do at your job. You want to go back to your job to get a break. <laughs> I tell you what, it's, it's different. We need to appreciate what other people are going through. You know, we need to appreciate uh, going through the situation. And uh, Someone said, you know, you can't really understand someone until you walk a mile in their shoes, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. But we need to understand the commission that was given to this man. God said, here's what I want you to do. He didn't stop and say, this guy didn't stop and say, well, what, what's he going to do? You, you rescued him. You, you delivered him from these demons. What's he going to do? He didn't say that. He just obeyed. He wanted to be with Jesus, wanted to spend time in his feet. Jesus said, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you, first of all, to go to your home. Now, what that teaches me also, our first commission we have as a Christian is to our family. It's to our home. 
It's to try to love them to Christ. We're not to take the Bible and use it as a club and beat them over the head with the truth, truth, truth. We love them. We're patient with them. We let God do the work in our heart. But we are going to have a consistent testimony. I remember in, when I first started going to church, and the kids uh, were real little. I don't remember uh, how old. I think Nathaniel maybe were, was just born at the time. I'm not sure. But uh, our family would have an activity. And uh, they weren't all in church yet. And at this activity, there was going to be drinking. There was, there was drugs. You know, pot wasn't legal at the time. There was, I knew there was going to be pot over there. There was going to be other things over there. There was going to be bad music. There was going to be all kinds of other stuff. Now, there's a couple of things Christians could have done. And some people may disagree with this, but I, I pray about it. I know this is what God wants to do. I wanted to reach my family. I wanted them to know that I cared. I wanted them to know that I was not better than they were. I didn't think myself better than they were. But they also knew I didn't like the stuff that they did. So we would go to a family activity, and we would go over for a little time. We'd spend maybe about 20 minutes, you know, at the most maybe 30 minutes. But we told the kids, they always got a lecture before they got over there. You can't go in the bedrooms with any other, other cousins. You can't go off by yourself. you got to stay with us the whole time. And every time we'd go over, that was, that was a lecture they got. Because at the time, my family didn't know. They didn't see anything wrong with the stuff they were doing. We did. But we wanted them to know that they were loved. And you see, I, I compared that to Jesus. Uh, he was kind of, he went out and he ate with publicans and sinners. Now, Jesus didn't go to the bars. He didn't go compromise his testimony and things. But he had no problem going to their house. He had no problem trying to love them where they were at. But he didn't partake in their sin to do it. And so that's what we did. And, and one by one, they started getting into church. One by one, they get saved. And we'd see a, a life get changed and a family get changed. Now, there's still problems. Each, each family, individual family, still has issues, still has problems. But that's where God wants us to go first. And once we go there and we can impact our families, he wants us also to start impacting lives around us. Now, you don't have to wait until you've impacted your family before you start witnessing other people. You ought to be doing them both at the same time. But what I'm saying is you ought to be a positive influence in their life. What kind of influence are you? Now, I wouldn't recommend what I did to everybody because not everybody, some people would use that as an excuse to justify some of the things they wanted to do anyway. I didn't use it as an excuse. God knew my heart. I was trying to reach my family. And by the grace of God, one by one, they were reached. Praise the Lord for that. I was even thinking today, or not today, uh, this past week when I went up to see my mom and dad. And uh, we were up there, and a couple of my sisters came over and we were talking, and I just thought, you know, it's such a difference. Such a difference in our family now. My dad was talking about they're building a shed out back, and they're wanting to, they just moved into a home, bought a home, and they're wanting to get their stuff out of the, out of the garage because the garage is kind of all cluttered up right now. They want to get the stuff out. And my dad's telling me, about, yeah, I want to get a, build a puppet stage and put it up right here. We want to have a good news club here in the area so all the kids can, because he has a bunch of puppets that he uses already in church. And he's like, I want to, I want to have a, a puppet ministry here in, in this area. I don't know if this is ever going to happen. My dad's 75 years old. But I thought, you know what? He's got a dream. He still wants to be used with God. It wasn't like this 20 years ago. What made the difference? Jesus. Jesus will make a difference in your family. If you have young kids, Jesus will make a difference in your family. But you need to be the influence first. Be a positive influence. Love them. Let Christ love them through you. That's what we need to do. Let's all stand and we'll have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. Lord, there are so many things that we can look at here in the scriptures. And, and Lord, sometimes my brain gets a little scrambled and runs away from me. But, Lord, I think the main thing is we need to realize that you can change your life. And, Lord, you are no respecter of persons. And, Lord, there are some times that we feel like even our own family members are sometimes a hopeless case. But, Lord, you are able to save to the uttermost. And, Lord, you are able to use us in ways that we never thought possible. But we need to be obedient. We need to be a faithful witness. We need to love others right where they are, not accepting their sin. It's okay to disagree with them and tell them that we don't agree with what they're doing, but we still love them. Because, Lord, you loved us right where we were. 
And that verse in the Bible, I'm so thankful, is theirs, Romans 5, 8. That you showed and proved your love to us in that while we were yet sinners, you chose to die for us. Father, help us to be just like the Savior. Help us to love people that way, that you can win them through us. And Father, I pray also that we know the devil's deceitful. We know he's tricky. We know different things that he tries to do. But Lord, I pray that you open our eyes to some of the things that he tries to bring into our homes, into our lives. And it comes so often through little sowings. It comes it's sometimes in the form of a cardinal. <clears throat> but it's ungodly teaching. We have to be very careful. God help us. Help us just to stand strong and true in this day and time in which we live. And thank you for loving us and thank you for your patience with us. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. 351. 351.